As many of you know, I am absolutely thoroughly convinced that to be truly Catholic, you should be submitted under a bishop. I believe in apostolic succession. I believe in the Episcopal form of government. I believe that it is historic and it has stood the test of time. And therefore, we as a duty, we as Christians have a duty to uphold it. However, as I have studied this subject and the development of the Episcopal form of government, one of the questions that I have had burning in my heart is, what am I to do with those who are not under a bishop, but have still come out of the Church of Rome directly? People like the, the magisterial reformers, so the Lutherans, the Anglicans, and the Reformed, the, both the Presbyterian and the Dutch Reformed and stuff. What do I do with, with the Lutherans and the Reformed? How do I understand their orders? Are they valid? Are they not valid? Do they have valid sacraments? And this is a question that plagues my mind because some of my favorite theologians of all time are from the Reformed and Lutheran camps. And so, in all seriousness, I have not wanted to ever say that I don't know if they are valid ministers and I don't know if they have valid sacraments. And so I decided doing a little bit of research into the subject would help me to kind of clarify my stance. And while my stance regarding the necessity of a bishop for the unity of the Catholic faith has not changed, I don't think it's as clear that these orders are invalid. Rome seems to think it's, it's abundantly clear. The East seems to think it's abundantly clear. I'm not convinced that it's so clear. And I have a few reasons that I want to go over today. The first being that in Scripture, it does not seem that there is a distinction between the office of presbyter and the office of bishop. There does not seem to be an ontological distinction between these two offices. In fact, Scripture uses these two offices interchangeably with one another. And so the thesis that I have is as follows. If it can be historically demonstrated beyond a shadow of a doubt that there is no distinction between the office of bishop and the office of presbyter except that of historical development and organization, then I think it's right and proper for us to say, well, it may be a necessary mark of Catholicity and continuity with the ancient church to be under a bishop, it is not a necessity in order to have valid ordinations and thus valid sacraments. So the first place I would go is 1 Timothy chapter 3. When Paul gives the qualifications for ministers in the church, he lists two offices, overseer or bishop and deacon. That's it. And in Titus, he very explicitly speaks of an overseer and a presbyter in the same way. This is what he says. To Titus, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint presbyters in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For a bishop as God's steward, must be above reproach. So right there, a very clear instance where these two terms are used in a synonymous fashion, an overseer, an elder, or a presbyter. And so those passages in Scripture made me at least pause and go, hmm, that's interesting. But then we go into the early church fathers, and we see a similar pattern. In First Clement, Chapter 42, this is what he says, starting in verse 4. So preaching both in the country and in the towns, they appointed their first fruits when they had tested them by the Spirit. He's talking about the apostles. The apostles had appointed their first fruits when they had tested them by the Spirit to be bishops and deacons for the future believers. And this was no thing, this was no new thing they did, for indeed somewhere Something that had been written about bishops and deacons many years ago, for somewhere in thus says the scripture, I will appoint their bishops in righteousness and their deacons in faith. So again, we only see these two offices, bishops and deacons, presbyters and deacons. The Didache, one of the earliest writings we have next to First Clement, 
says this, Therefore, this is chapter 15, verse 1, Therefore, appoint for yourselves bishops and deacons worthy of the Lord, men who are humble. I just want to pause there. An interesting point, too, to point out. It says, therefore, appoint for yourselves bishops and deacons, which calls into question whether or not the laying on of hands in apostolic succession was an absolute essential necessity early on in the church. Now, that's not a knockout argument against that. I still think the the reasons to hold to an apostolic succession are greater than not, but it is to say that the magisterium of the Catholic Church, what they claim it to be, what they claim a bishop is in ontological necessity, is not clear from the early church. We have Paul using bishop and priest synonymously. We have the Didache. We have First Clement using those terms synonymously with one another. And we have only two offices showing up. And so the question is, if these offices, if there's only two offices, then where do the bishops come from? Now, I can make a great historical argument for the necessity of bishops and why that came up after the apostles. The apostles kind of represented bishops. They needed a chief presbyter to step up and fulfill the role as an apostle in some sense. But even if we take that, even if we take that and run with it and we say this is what the church has done and we recognize that, which I do, it is still not clear that a presbyter is a lesser office than a bishop or somehow ontologically distinct in such a way that an ordination of a presbyter to another presbyter would be invalid. My last point of evidence is from Jerome. It's from his letter to Evangelius. This is what it says. When subsequently one presbyter was chosen to preside over the rest, this was done to remedy schism and to prevent each individual from rending the church of Christ by drawing it to himself. For even at Alexandria, from the time of Mark the Evangelist, until the episcopates of Heracles and Dionysius, the presbyters always named as bishop, one of their own number, chosen by themselves and set in a more exalted position, just as one, just as an army elects a general, or as a deacon appoints one of themselves, whom they know to be diligent and call him archdeacon. For what function, excepting ordination, belongs to a bishop that does not also belong to a presbyter? Is it not the case that there is one church at Rome and another in all the world beside? Gaul and Britain, Africa and Persia, India and the East worship one Christ and observe one rule of truth. If you ask for authority, the world outweighs its capital. Wherever there is a bishop, whether it be at Rome, Angublium, whether it be at Constantinople or Hagium, whether it be at Alexandria or Zoan, his dignity is one and his priesthood is one. Neither the command of wealth nor the lowliest of poverty makes him more a bishop or less a bishop. All alike are successors of the apostles. And so here we see an argument that seems to indicate that the elevation of bishop into this unique office with the power to ordain was one of practicality, not of one of ontological necessity. And so Jerome acknowledges that all the functions except ordination belong equally to the presbyter and the bishop. But he also acknowledges that the difference between a bishop and a presbyter is simply that of organization, that of ecclesial unity, that of protecting against schism, and that of helping the church to visibly represent itself as one. And we see this echoed in Ignatius of Antioch, who emphasizes the bishop, emphasizes the bishop, but still acknowledges the presbyters as being the successors of the apostles. And so all of this to say, I am not in any sense seeking to undermine the Episcopal form of government. I do believe that my Presbyterian brothers and sisters, my Lutheran brothers and sisters, and even further out on the outskirts, my, my Baptist brothers and sisters, they are in the wrong for persisting in a form of government that is contrary to the Catholicity of the church. But that being said, I don't think it's clear cut that their ordinations and their sacraments are somehow invalidated because of the fact that the ordinations were largely done through presbyters rather than bishops.
I think we must acknowledge the fact that these two offices from the early days of Christianity were seen as the same office and the separation between bishop and presbyter came as an organizational ecclesiastical necessity for unity, not as an ontological distinction written in sand by God himself, appointed by the apostles themselves in order to maintain this infallible magisterium that alone has the power to address issues, ordain ministers. Um, I think that that stretches history a little bit further than I'm willing to go. And so this video is really uh, an exciting one for me because it's one for me to say, I do believe that my brothers and sisters in the Reformed and Lutheran tradition possess valid orders in apostolic succession in a very real way, considering the fact that coming from Rome, the presbyters that laid hands on other presbyters all can trace their lineage back in the same way that I as an Anglican can say that we can through our bishops. And so, yes, it's not ideal. Yes, it's a departure from Catholicity. Yes, I'm calling them back into a greater Catholicity, become Anglican. But I am acknowledging their orders as valid. And I think that that is an important step in acknowledging the, the body of Christ for what it is, larger and more messy than we could ever imagine, but beautifully united to her bride through the sacraments, uh, specifically the Eucharist. So I hope this video was helpful. Um, push back in the comments, as you always do, and I'll talk to you guys next week. Thanks for watching that video. If you want to see more content like this, I can't do it without your support. So please click the link below and become a supporter over on Locals. There you'll be part of a community, and you will also help financially support the work that I'm doing on this channel so we can all grow into a deeper Catholicity together.